Then let us take a few moments of silence to prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we listen to the tolling of our church bell this morning. Will you join me for the call to worship? The prophet Micah said that the Lord requires us to do justice. Give us the Lord with the yearning for justice. Micah said that the Lord requires us to love kindness. Help us, Holy One, to look with kindness upon our world. Micah said that the Lord requires us to walk humbly with God. in our unison prayer of approach, which is printed in your bulletins. Let us pray together. Let us hear what you will speak, O God. Speak peace to your people, to your faithful, as we turn to you in our hearts. Save us from ourselves, we pray, from our arrogance and greed. Renew our faith and help us to look at others and the world with eyes that are not clouded by hate or anger but opened with compassion. Help us to serve others with minds and hands that do not judge or withhold your good gifts, 
but rather offer them abundantly as you have offered them to us. Send your spirit upon us, strengthening us and calling us to care and service in the way of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So you're going to have a new class with a new teacher, with new classmates, and it's all going to be brand new, right? Possibly. Maybe not for everyone. <laughs> so are you excited? I'm Yeah, good. Are you, like, a little scared? Maybe there's a little, maybe you're not sure if you're going to like your teacher, right? Okay, good. Uh, maybe you're not sure if you're going to like your classmates. Will you have any friends in your class? Maybe you're thinking they might ask you to do some hard things you don't know how to do yet, right? So if you're feeling this way, please remember that all of us at some time in our life go through times that are a little bit scary to us because we've never done it before, right? Sometimes something new happens, like maybe you have to move, or someone in your family gets sick or loses a job or something else changes and it's pretty scary. So this actually happened to one of the greatest people in the Bible. His name is Abraham. And when God asked him to move his whole family and all his animals, which were quite a lot of animals, to a new place far away, he was pretty unsure what was going on and probably very scared. He didn't even know where God was going to bring him. But when we have a new situation to deal with in our lives, we can take a lesson from Abraham. He trusted God to be with him every step of the way. One day at a time, he trusted God. And things worked out pretty well for him once he decided to just listen to God and trust his guidance. So the good news is that God promises to be with us all the time. And we experience that in a very special way when we have to go through a new situation that might be a little scary. God is always with us. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, they used to call God Emmanuel. That means God with us. They knew God was with them all the time. And in the New Testament, Jesus tells us, Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So when we pray to God and then listen in our hearts for his, his guidance and his wisdom and what we think we're hearing from God, we can get very close to him and not be alone anymore. 
So God will walk through the scary situation with us, and we will end up feeling closer to God because we listen for his guidance. So let's say a little prayer. Dear God, we thank you for always being with us. Whenever we get a little bit nervous because of something new we have to go through, help us to remember to pray to you and listen to your voice in our hearts, giving us strength and guidance and helping us to follow you. Thank you for Jesus. Amen. You may go down to church school. Please be seated. Will you pray with me? Holy One, bless us as we hear these words from the scripture. Bless us as we hear them and ponder them in our hearts. In them and through them, may we hear your call to be your best people, not only for ourselves, our families, or our church, but the world. Amen. This morning's first reading is from the book of the prophet Micah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O my people, what have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, that Balaam, son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Golgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. 
With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Would the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give him my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. This morning's second reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Final reading this morning is from the letter of the Romans, chapter 13, verse 8. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. May God bless to our understanding these words from the scripture. Amen. Good morning. Uh, First, I'd like to bring you greetings from the Congregational Church of Naugatuck, where I serve as the interim senior pastor. And um, I want to let you know that um, my call at at Naugatuck is a particular blessing for me because that church has allowed me to continue in this ministry that I've been at for several years now, um, bringing awareness uh, about mass incarceration to other churches in Connecticut. Um, So far, I've preached at 65 UCC churches around the state of Connecticut. There's only 235 altogether. So, you know, I've made a little dent, but I still have a fur piece to go. (laughs) So I thank you so much for welcoming me to your pulpit this morning. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So our Old Testament reading this morning is from the prophet Micah, and I think it provides a wonderful entrance into my topic of mass incarceration. It's almost as if Micah were here today, surveying the landscape of our land and as he makes his proclamations. You see, Micah was a prophet who was preaching in the southern kingdom of Judah near the end of the eighth century BC. He was a prophet who understood his task to be a preacher of the truth, to expose injustice and inequality, to offer a word of hope and salvation, and to make known a vision of a new and transformed way of life for his community and for his world. I think he offers that same vision to us today. The passage that we will be exploring this morning begins appropriately, I think, in a courtroom. But it's no ordinary courtroom. This is a courtroom in the vast outdoors. This is a court where God is serving as the prosecutor, bringing the charges against a people who have allowed injustice to become rampant in the land. This is a court where God is serving as both judge and jury. God calls upon his people, upon you and upon me, to rise and plead our case before the mountains. And God instructs the mountains, the very foundations of the earth, to listen, for God has a bone to pick with us mortals. In this courtroom scene, we even find God serving as the plaintiff, saying, oh, my people, what have I done to you? In what way have I wearied you? God then reminds us all of all that we owe God. And it's a lot, it's it's life itself and everything in it. As Micah allows this scene to unfold, we are reminded of the ways that we try to please God. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings with calves a year old, 
Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Will God find me worthy if I show up at church every Sunday? Can I buy my way into God's good graces with extravagant gifts? No, says Micah. Micah says that what the Lord requires is pretty simple. He says that we must do justice. He says that we must love kindness. He says that we must walk humbly with God. So what does that mean for us today? In what way can we take these words of Micah and apply them to the way we do justice or don't in America today? Well, I believe that if we apply these words to our nation's system of mass incarceration, we would find ourselves indicted by Micah's words. Let's take a look at Micah's list of requirements one by one to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. First, do justice. Our criminal justice system as it stands today offers precious little justice for many Americans. And that lack of justice has resulted in a system of mass incarceration the likes of which has never been seen before in the world. The fact is that the United States holds in its prisons and jails, federal and state, a combined total of 2.2 million people. That's one in every 99 adults behind bars. And if we count the numbers of people who are on probation or parole, still under some sort of correctional control, or still unable due to a criminal record to re-enter law-abiding society, that number climbs to a staggering 65 million people. We have more people in prison than do the top 35 European countries combined. As we hear these numbers, as I heard these numbers for the very first time, I had to ask, and I, and I think you might be thinking, so aren't these people just more criminal than everybody else in America? And the answer is yes and no. Yes, because many folks get caught up in illegal activity because our society offers little opportunities for them to support themselves and their families. And no, because others of these folks are subject to the targeted enforcement of our nation's mostly failed war on drugs. Enforcement targeted at poor communities. But whether the answer to that question is yes or no for any given individual, the fact is that our prisons are mostly packed with our nation's poor people. Two-thirds of the people in prison lived below the poverty line prior to their imprisonment. And upwards of 90% of those incarcerated in our nation's prisons suffer from some sort of addictive disorder, some sort of dis behavioral disorder, and or mental illness, many needing treatment rather than incarceration. And while many of those imprisoned are young men of color, the largest increase in incarceration over the last few years has been poor white men and increasingly women who overwhelmingly get caught up in criminal activity as a result of being victims themselves. We live in a nation that imprisons its most marginalized citizens at an alarming rate. The poor, the mentally ill, the, major the minorities. We as a society, you and me, we have let this happen, even though most of us, without knowing what the actual numbers are, would answer Micah's indictment by saying, well, of course we do justice. We do not justice as a nation. But it isn't so. It isn't so because we've taken what is essentially a public health issue, drug addiction, and criminalized it. Unlike our response to alcohol abuse, which we usually respond to with treatment, we've made the abuse of drugs a criminal offense. Strike one for on Micah's list of requirements to do justice. We're not doing justice in America. So how about requirement number two, loving kindness? How are we doing there? 
Well, I would submit that we're not doing too hot there either. <laughs> One certainly cannot find any kindness in the way that our society deals with those coming out of prison, allegedly having paid their debt to society. You see, our criminal justice system has penalties and prohibitions that go well beyond the actual period of imprisonment. No, when, when folks from poor communities are released after having served their time, they often cannot go home to live in federal public housing. It's not allowed, so they're homeless. They can't get on any kind of federal public assistance, not even food stamps. It's not allowed, so they're hungry. Employment discrimination is illegal, but still, many employers will not hire them, so they have few prospects. The system is structured such that the most rational thing for them to do is to reoffend and go back to prison, and then we are dismayed at the high rate of recidivism, even though the way the system is structured, it offers them little other choice. I submit that what is missing is love, loving kindness for folks in our society whose lives we think are so very different from our own. But are they truly? And that question takes me back to Micah's requirements. The last is to walk humbly with God. How humble are we when we look at folks who are addicted to illegal drugs and who cannot find any treatment programs because we don't vote to fund appropriately those kinds of expenditures, even though we taxpayers do all toll pay upwards of $1 billion a year to keep our prisons open and operating in Connecticut. How humble are we when we look at those folks and think, I'm so much better than they are. I would never take illegal drugs. I think it's instructive right here to stop and think why people take drugs at all, any people. And I think we can all agree that it's because they're in some kind of pain. We're in pain, physical pain, mental pain, emotional pain, spiritual pain, and they take drugs to try to deaden that pain. So when someone who lives in Essex or Westport or Hamden or North Haven where I live or perhaps Brookfield, when they're experiencing that kind of pain, they go off to see their primary care physician who writes them a prescription and sends them off to the drugstore to buy some perfectly legal drugs like Valium or Zoloft. But another person, a poor person, living in the inner city with few prospects and less opportunities, worried about where she will get money to put food on the table for the kids, when that person wants to deaden the pain, the choice that she has is often different. She probably doesn't have a primary care physician, and if she did, she wouldn't have a way to get there except on pu public transportation, which we also don't fund too well. And if, if she did find her way to a private doctor and get a prescription written, then she would have to worry about whether she'd had the money to fill it. Instead, she might go down to the corner to some petty drug dealer and buy a very little bit of something for a very little bit of money initially. And it's all very illegal because we've made it so very illegal. And we look back on that poor mother trying to get through another day and we look at her with scorn. I know we don't have much humility going on as we tisk tisk about her behavior. And that's just comparing the use of legal drugs with illegal drugs. I won't even suggest that people who live in areas where there is no targeted enforcement of the war on drugs just might be abusing illegal drugs as well. I won't ask anyone here to raise their hands. If they've ever taken an illegal drug and suffered no legal consequence. I'll just point out that thinking ourselves so much better than those whose lives have been devastated by our society's rush to incarcerate is not surely a sign of our walking humbly with our God. 
if, like me, you are surprised about our nation's system of mass incarceration and want to learn more about it, I encourage you to stay after church today when I will uh, provide more information and uh, provide an opportunity for you to ask questions. I welcome challenging questions. I believe, I believe that our, our imprisoning our, we are imprisoning our poorest Americans. I believe that we are imprisoning our darkest Americans in massive numbers. And then we are setting up a system that locks them into a poverty from which there's little or no escape. <laughs> and then we blame them for their misfortune. And I believe that that is not what the prophet Micah says that the Lord requires of us. Imprisoning our poorest Americans and then creating a system where the punishment never ends does not square any way with doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with God. So, what is it that we can do? How can we fix this? Well, we can advocate for an end to policies that create and support mass incarceration. Policies like stop and frisk, a policy only ever implemented in our inner cities, that politicians in the 80s and 90s were characterizing as war zones in the inner city, where everyone could be assumed to be a criminal. Randomly stopping young men and women created the kind of distrust in many of the, in the inner city that they feel for police today. In January, we heard an inaugural address that acts like the current opioid epidemic is a problem in the inner cities, setting black and brown people up again for targeted enforcement, while those in the towns and suburbs where the current epidemic actually is taking place get drug treatment programs instead. What can we do? We can bring an end to policies like zero tolerance in schools which has done more to fill the pre-K to prison pipeline than anything else. Our juvenile justice system here in Connecticut is filled with over 75% young people of color. And these numbers are not unique to Connecticut. They represent a nationwide reality. What is it that we can do? We can advocate for free universal early childhood education, since over 70% of all offenders are and ex-offenders are high school dropouts. Studies show that early childhood education goes a long way toward preventing incarceration from ever happening. We can think about hiring ex-offenders and offering them a chance to start over with a clean slate. Many of these people, for the most part, want to work. They want to feel the pride that you and I take for granted the pride of doing a job and doing it well and being able to support ourselves and our families. The Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans told us how to fulfill the law, the law of, law of Moses and the law of God. He said, owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Fulfilling the law, says Paul, is about loving God's people, all God's people, those sitting next to us in the pews and those sitting somewhere in a prison cell. In the gospel according to Luke that we heard read this morning, we find Jesus going back home after his baptism to declare the beginning of his public ministry. And as a good Jew, he went into the synagogue to make his public announcement. Now, Jesus had the entire Torah, the five books of the Bible that he might have quoted, the five first books. He had all of the books of history, Joshua, 1st and 2nd Judges, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Chronicles. We had all, he had all the minor prophets and all the major prophets to choose from. So I think it's very instructive that Jesus chose the passage from the prophet Isaiah to kick off his ministry. He opened the book of Isaiah and read, the spirit of the Lord is upon me 
because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I believe what Micah says about what the Lord requires. I believe that we need to take Jesus' words to heart and work as partners with God to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor when the captives would go free. I believe that Micah is calling us in our time to begin to dismantle what our broken criminal justice system has built. And I believe that in so doing, we will begin in a new way to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with God. Amen. Friends, will you join with me now in our preparation for prayer? Friends, as we come to our time of gathered prayer, I would remind you of the names that are printed on the backs of your bulletin and invite you to keep those folks in your prayers today and in the days ahead. Um, as is usually the case, we have a number of prayers to add to our list this morning. Um, as we look out at the world, we of course want to be um, in prayer for those who are, have been affected by Hurricane Harvey in Texas. Um, and the rain that is to come, estimates have been anywhere from 40 to 60 inches of rain and how you deal with that, we are not exactly sure. Um, we wanna be especially in prayer for Wendy Elson who is down there, um, was in Houston visiting with her daughter and son-in-law and their son Harris. Um, Wendy and her daughter and, and grandson have evacuated to San Antonio, but um, her son-in-law is still in Houston trying to kind of prevent flooding in their house. So prayers for Nick especially. Um, for those continuing to reel from the violence in Charlottesville, for those whom Marilyn has enlightened us about this morning, um, for the victims of the naval battleship crash uh, last week that happened and their families and um, for the victims of the terror attacks in Brussels and in London uh, this past week as well. Um, as we look to concerns of our community closer to home here, um, we have sad news to share with you this morning that Fred Lyon, um, Reverend Fred Lyon, the former pastor here um, in the early 70s, passed away um, this morning. That's Mark Lyon's dad. Um, and so we want to um, offer prayers for his wife, Carol, for Mark, for their entire family. Um, he uh, died after battling leukemia um, over these last years. So. Um, we want to be praying for many of our church members who are walking the difficult journey of making decisions um, about health care and about um, housing for um, aging spouses and parents, um, folks for whom they, um, they are caring for and, and just need to make those decisions in these next few weeks. So we want to be in prayer for them. And of course, um, we want to be in prayer for our families who have been affected um, by drug use and by addiction, um, families that have been affected by imprisonment or um, by death um, through the opioid epidemic that's happening um, in our nation today. Um, we do have some joys to share, as I mentioned. So. Um, 
Brand spoke to Marilyn about coming here and preaching today back in the spring. And so the fact that she is here means that it is the end of August and that is crazy. Um, but if I know Marilyn, then I know that she really is willing to um, accept your questions, your comments, um, anything else after worship today. So we do hope that you will um, join her downstairs for a bit more um, information and, and an opportunity to engage her in conversation. Um, but that also means um, whether a joy or concern, I'm not sure that our students, as Sue mentioned, are going back to school. Um, many of our college folks have now been dropped off. We have a number of empty nester families um, hanging out at, at, around our church. Um, there were a few who came to worship at 8.30 and said, now we have to figure out whether we like each other. <laughs> I said, well, there you go. Uh, but so prayers for our students and for our teachers um, who are going back to school as well. Um, we have some other joys to share. Um, the birth of Ryan Thomas Murphy, who is Robin and Mike Murphy's newest grandbaby. Uh, Ryan was born this past week to um, Lindsay and Dan, um, and so we are excited to share that joy. Um, for Lori Capabianco and her new husband, Larry, um, who were married yesterday, I said to, to Lori, so I hear a rumor that you're getting married. And she said, yeah, we figured after 24 years together, we probably should. Um, so, <laughs> so she and Larry have spent a number of years together, and now they have tied the knot. Um, so prayers for them. Uh, we are grateful for these two fabulous women who are here, Marianne and Diane, for sharing their gifts with us once again. Uh, yesterday was Pastor Bryn's uh, birthday, and so prayers for her. She and John are in D.C. celebrating uh, one with another. And um, I would like to say to you all, happy anniversary, church. Uh, Twelve years ago this week, you uh, called a random young woman uh, into ministry here, and um, I thank you so much for that opportunity. So, 12 years together, church, 12 years. <laughs> So, and I know that um, many of you also come with thoughts and prayers on your hearts and your minds this day. So for whom else shall we be in prayer? Yeah, Gordon. Then let us join our hearts and our souls in the spirit of prayer. God, as we gather on this Sunday morning that is so beautiful here in Connecticut, we realize that there are so many places in our own nation and in the world that are struggling with natural disasters, with wildfires, with war, with famine, with issues that we may never know or understand. And so we pray, God, that you would just be with all of these people, all of these places, because we feel your presence in this place where you gather us as a family of faith, one with another together where we are able to speak words of hope into the difficulties of our own lives and into the world, where, we are, where you use us as agents of hope to speak words of comfort, to speak words of care to those in our own community who are in need of it, so many that we have lifted up today for reason of concern, and places beyond these walls too. We are praying for all of those who are grieving today, God, that you would offer them your peace, which passes all understanding. We are praying for those who are in need of health and healing in these days, that you would grant that in whichever way you know is best. And we are praying your wisdom and your guidance for those who are making difficult decisions in these times. We include in that bucket, God, our world leaders, knowing that they are in need of your wisdom and guidance as they face so many difficult decisions, not only for our own nation, but for nations around the world. God, Karl Barth, the theologian, once said that, you, that we should, as Christians, face the world with a newspaper in one hand and the Bible in the other. And so we pray that you would offer us guidance as well, that as we look at our world each and every day, that you would grant us ways to know where it is that you call us to make a difference to show mercy, to show love, to be able to use our gifts and skills in service to you. And God, we thank you for those places where we are able to see glimpses of joy in new life, in birthdays, in anniversaries, in moments of healing, in moments of renewed health. God, you are our teacher, our example, our companion, and we thank you that you walk this journey with us and that you do not require 
us to settle a score or to offer you a debt, but rather what you call us to do is to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with you. So we pray now, God, that you would show us the ways and the places where you call us to do just that, and that you would grant us the courage, the measure of love that it takes, the wisdom to know where those places are, where those situations are, and that you would help us do it all, following the example of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Um, so today, we have the opportunity to hear from Bob Lambert. However, Bob Lambert was at the 8.30 service, so I told him I would do my best Bob Lambert impression at the service. <laughs> um, really, what that means is that I would like to share his words for you um, in his call to share today. And so Bob says this, I love my church because, having been a member of this church for over a third of a century, I have many reasons. Fabulous friendships, wonderful pastors, the many ways the church has grown in its infrastructure, in diversity, and in inclusiveness. But my strongest love here is the way it shaped our children's lives. They grew up here and treated it as their home for all the good and bad in that behavior. <laughs> now in their 40s, they turned out well with deep and strong Christian values. They love to come home and attend this church whenever they can with the next generation in tow. Bob says, thank you all for all of that and the role that you played, and God bless you. He says, I love to give to the work of our church because it is an investment, and instilling Christian faith in the next generation, the returns in this investment are immeasurable. So now, as we have been so richly blessed, let us offer our support to the ministry of our church with joyful hearts. This morning's offering will now be received.
Friends, will you join with me now in our offertory prayer? Loving God, we thank you for the many gifts you have offered to us. We offer some of these gifts back to you now in order to further the work of this beloved community in your ways of welcome, love, and justice. Bless these offerings and us, that we might be a blessing to others, both inside these walls, but especially beyond them. Amen. And now, friends, please remain standing and join us in singing our final hymn, Lord Whose Love Through Humble Service. And you can yell at the person who created the bulletin this week. It is actually 461. <laughs> And now may God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice and freedom and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, 
rejection, hunger, and war, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in the world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done to bring justice and kindness to all God's people. Go now to love and serve the Lord. Amen. So friends, we do invite you downstairs for a time of fellowship. Um, and if you would like to, to stay and spend some time with Marilyn, Miss Debbie will be on hand for childcare during that opportunity. But now friends, blessed with the peace of Christ, let us share those signs of peace with one another and bring those signs out into the world as well. The peace of Christ be with you all. I think I probably just go straight down. Is that okay? Go for it.